Welcome back. It's still the year in review. Plus Africa TV, I am Mariana Cohn. For the health sector, which we did prompt you earlier on about, the outgoing 2018 was eventful. There were lots of issues, controversies, medical breakthroughs, and disappointments. The health sector started on a controversial note as one of the major health unions in the country called for the sack of the Minister of Health, Isaac Adewali. The country also witnessed disease outbreaks. Now, joining me to look at some of the issues is Dr. Baba Chidi Lawson. It's good to have you in the studio. Thank Thanks you for having us. me. All right. So now we already know the problems that the health sector in the country is facing. And one would wonder why, if over the years, governor, doctors have protested, Joe Hesu has protested, you know, people just keep going on one strike or the other. Why has it been so difficult to address these seething issues that is affecting the health sector? Um, thank you. I think one very important thing to note is that there would always be workplace conflicts occasionally. Mm -hmm. Now, with respect to the doctors and the other health workers, a lot of it has just been based on a lack of clarity in terms of what is your expected income. Mm vis-a-vis -vis what are your entitlements, amongst other things. And for some reason, um, this I would put squarely at the foot of the government. Why? Well, the government is the major employer of, for healthcare in the country. Health is a basic necessity. It's a government responsibility. So it is the responsibility of the government to articulate a program, employ, and let people know what is expected of them, as well as let them also know what their entitlements are. Mm -hmm. So if this is clearly spelled out, there really isn't going to be any form of um, dissent saying that, okay, this individual is getting what is not due mm. to him or her. Okay. Okay. Well, we have a, a report. We'll just quickly take a break. Um, we have a report on the health sector. When we come back, we'll talk more about this. Uh, we'll be right back after the break. 2018 has been a tough year in the health sector in Africa and Nigeria in particular. One major worrisome incident was a report on the abuse of cough syrups, which contains codeine, which overtook Tramadol as the most abused opiate in Nigeria, with 3 million bottles drunk every day in the north of Nigeria alone. Following this ordeal, the Joint Health Sector Unions and Association of Health Workers, except doctors, embarked on over a one-month strike. This obviously shook the already ailing health system in Nigeria. And to worsen the situation, there were reports by the Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project on humanitarian crisis with corruption and mismanagement at government-run hospitals and a further report of over 50% of Nigerian-trained medical doctors which are currently practicing abroad. When you go to different centers, you don't have doctors. Sometimes you have doctors. Those are the problem. They should employ more health workers in order to solve this problem. The infrastructure, you don't go to hospital, you don't have syringe, there are no glove. How can you work? I'm a Nigerian medical doctor. I've been practicing for the last five years. I practiced for four years in Nigeria and uh, practiced the last one year here in the United Kingdom. Medical practice in Nigeria was tough. It was good. It, it was um, nice because we had to read I mean, we had to do lots of work, but that's the thing. I did a lot of work, I, um, but I didn't get the fulfillment that I was looking for. And I'm talking about financially, but not just that. Um, I had patients come to me whom I genuinely wanted to help, whom I genuinely had the knowledge to help, but I had no resource to help them. And I watched people die of silly things, I would say. Another wave that hit the health sector were disease outbreaks with the first being the Ebola outbreak in Democratic Republic of Congo, with over 500 confirmed cases and 278 confirmed deaths. Following this was a Lassa fever outbreak that spread to 18 states of Nigeria, the largest outbreak ever recorded, with 1,081 suspected cases and 90 recorded deaths. Next to that was the largest cholera outbreak in 20 states in Nigeria, in states like Adamawa, Gombe, Katsina, with over 42,000 reported cases and 830 deaths. This didn't stop here. There were also cases of diarrhea in 10 communities in Bornu, with over 1,068 persons affected, and then the yellow fever outbreak currently active in 14 states in Nigeria, with over 1,600 suspected cases. 
in response to these outbreaks and in strengthening the health security of Nigeria. The National Center for Disease Control inaugurated an operational national reference laboratory and an incident coordination center, which is to serve as an emergency operations center during outbreaks. The biggest uh, development post Ebola was the setting up of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. So the process had already started, but it was after that Ebola outbreak that everyone recognized why it's important to have a center that has the expertise, resources, capabilities to guide our response so that we're not responding in an ad hoc reactionary way. So there are people that are analyzing the data, making decisions, deciding on where to deploy resources, what to put in warehouses, how to keep vaccines, uh, reagents, whatever we need to respond. So that has really created a hub in Abuja with these resources. Now, our work actually happens all the time. We have responded 34 times this year to different small clusters of cases in the States. No one hears about this, but this is how we like our work. We really don't want a big outbreak, because when a big outbreak happens, it means that we have failed somewhere along the line. Looking at the recent reports, that over 20 million Nigerians are living with viral hepatitis. 2018 had seen various awareness campaigns for hepatitis B and C, diabetes and cancer, as there was a major spike in these cases. This, however, begs the question of how many people are aware of their health status and do routine medical checks. Hepatitis A and E are usually transmitted through fecal oral means, so meaning how you, so it gets into your digestive system and that's how you pick up what that is A and E. Now for B, C, D, they're usually caused by blood and blood products. So really worry much about the ones that are transmitted through blood and blood products because of the nature of the viruses, of the, the nature of the illness and how, how it runs because found out that those hepatitis B, C, they, are, they can lead to liver cancers. Cancers, simply put, is abnormal growth. We like to encourage women to do self-breast examination, even without any risk factor or, or any indication for it. It's um, advisable to regularly check for lumps in your breast. I'm a proud member of the OMB one And um, obviously, we decided as a, as a group to sponsor a CSR where we bring awareness to um, female breast cancer and the fact that most black women or most African women older than 40 don't, are not aware about, of their body. They don't pay attention to lumps under their breasts. When it comes to universal health coverage, Nigeria ranks low as only 4% of the population gain access to quality health care without facing financial hardship. When the NHIS was set up, the, uh, really the odds were stacked against success. However, they were given the mandate, the NHIS, to uh, encourage the adoption at state level of state-supported health insurance schemes. So in other words, in addition to doing whatever they are doing in terms of implementing health insurance, they should encourage states to set up their own. And this is where I feel the NHIS has not really grasped that challenge. They're still mainly focusing on doing theirs and then assisting states here and there. So if you want to measure their success, look at how many states have state-supported health insurance scheme. The Lagos State, in response to this, has recently launched the Lagos State Health Insurance Scheme. So, as we count down to the end of the year, and although the 2019 healthcare budget presented by the president still falls short of the pledge of African Union leaders to commit at least 50% of their annual budgets, it has not totally been all gloom, as there are little victories worth celebrating, such as the launch of the Patients' Bill of Rights, which identifies rights and privileges in a patient-caregiver relationship for the protection of all parties and to promote higher healthcare standards. And of course, the launch of the National Action Plan for Health 2018 to 2022, as well as other healthcare policies to better improve the health and well-being of Nigerians. Susan Jasper, Plus TV Africa. Welcome back. Um, well, we still have in the studio uh, Dr. Baba Jide, but uh, the Executive Secretary of the National Health Insurance Scheme, NHIS, Professor Yusuf Usman, said earlier this year that over 90% of Nigerians are eligible for the scheme have not been covered. 90. What do you think is the reason for this, Dr. Baba Jide? Because, you know, 
if 90% is not being covered, how come it's just 10%? In all of these years, I have heard about the NHIS for a long time. What do you think the problem is? Well, um, one thing that we should note is that a lot of us that live in Lagos and have access, that have in health insurance, is not really a true reflection of the picture of the whole of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And again, it takes me back to what I've always alluded to and said from the beginning, that health is a government responsibility. Mm -hmm. And the aim for health should actually be universal health coverage, meaning everybody ideally should be able to access health care. Now, you now need to articulate a plan towards this. And one of the aspects of this is health insurance, which means that when there is a health problem, you don't need to think of paying out of pocket before you can access care. Now, of course, a lot of other things go alongside with mm -hmm. it. Legislation to support it. Certain things like legislation for emergency room care, even whether you, I mean, whether you have insurance or not. Or not. Mm -hmm. So a lot of all these things. Then, of course, how much information has been disseminated it's not you and I that have to watch TV. I mean, how many radio jingles do we have? What is the NHIS program? Town in hall Zampara? meetings, maybe, for those who are not as educated. Yeah. You know, because, and the other thing there is, again, when we don't know what our population is, how do we roll out? Because when it comes to stuff like this, you need to have your facts and figures. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to say, we project that we have 100 million people, we should be able to have registered 95 million people by the year 2025 at the rate of getting maybe 10 or 15 million on an annual basis. So you have a set target and you have a plan in motion to attain that. Mm -hmm. So without all this, it will be difficult. Yes, the NHIS is a laudable idea, but you need to also have an action plan to ensure that it is effective. Uh, because, you know, the eligibility, uh, or, or sorry, the coverage of those who we say can be eligible is, is in question, like you have said. So the NHIS cannot work in isolation. It needs to be in synergy with the Population Commission. It needs to work with the Bureau of Statistics and the enemy or the Medical Association to be sure that these are the strategies we have to put in place to work. So it takes me to the next question. Um, if we already have some statistics, because you're saying we're not sure, but let's say we're going by what the NPA or the NPC has given to mm -hmm. us, and that's where they're getting these 90% statistics from. Mm -hmm. What do you think, again, I'm backtracking to my question, is not allowing them to go past 10%? Because when I was a little girl, we had health posts that were working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had health centers in local government areas that were accessible and working. Now they're just open rooms, absolutely nothing. They hardly, ha hardly have doctors who visit. You might have a few nurses here and there. But people really can't get access to Medicare even in those places. Let's forget about the NHIS for a second. The basic health care is no longer available. Why is this? Okay, now, um, the linchpin for universal health coverage is the creation of primary health care and health care centers. Mm -hmm. Now, if um, the Alma Mater, Alma Mater Declaration of 1978 that was given the Millennium Development Goals then recommended that there should be primary health care centers within a five kilometer radius. Mm -hmm. Now, the idea behind that would be that it is within a distance that is reasonably covered. Mm -hmm. Now, when these centers uh, when these centers are in existence. Of course, with a clear-cut, well-articulated program, you know that, yes, we have a primary health care center here. That means you need to staff, you need to equip. You also need to get the um, powers that be, traditional rulers, the politicians, the local government chairman, to encourage patronage, facilitate use by whether... Um, a community-based uh, health insurance program or something, mm. and then tap into the national program so that when people come, not that you get there, there are no doctors on duty, or 
there's no, there are no drugs. Mm -hmm. Or if the drugs are there, you can't afford them. Mm -hmm. And think about it. It takes us back again to certain other things. Is it the individual that has a minimum wage of 18,000 naira who has to feed, transport, pay rent? I mean, he, there are alternatives that are cheaper that he'd rather go for. So you probably go and meet the guy on the roadside and get something for 50 naira or 100 naira. But they could kill him. They could well, also not work. It could make the situation worse. Well, there's a, it could also get in better. Well, interestingly, let's talk about the issue of um, syrups, cough syrups. We'll come back to talking about the NHIS. We can easily just walk into a, a pharmacy and get a drug, um, um, cough syrup over the counter, which I think that's not possible anymore. But, you know, it was easy. I, I liked to take those kind of expectorants that make you sleepy because it, when you're awake, the cough goes away. But we did not realize that it was being, you know, somewhat uh, abused. abused. So the federal government announced a ban on the production and import of cough syrups um, containing codeine. Mm -hmm. So do you think this was somewhat a solution to the problem at the time? Did it even do anything or has it somewhat necessitated a black market for it? Now, everything in life, there are things that come that, may, that you don't expect to anticipate. However, what you owe yourself and the people would be a response. And I think the government decided to act in what they felt at that particular point in time was the best. So clamp down on it. Let's first of all stop this thing going out. Mm -hmm. Let's see what is out there. And then let us now regulate how it goes out mm -hmm. further. So it does make sense to start, that, start out like that. However, you know, um, one other thing, one concept I'd like to also talk about is what you would refer to as the social mm -hmm. determinants of health. Mm -hmm. So social determinants of health talk about social factors that mm -hmm. have a bearing, yeah. not, on the individual of, uh, not on the health of an individual, but on the health of a group mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. Now, the addiction is not the problem in of itself. It is representative of something else going on. Mm -hmm. And one of the social determinants of health that we talk about sometimes, income, you talk of unemployment, and even when you talk of income, you talk of the income gap. Now, a lot of the individuals that are taking these drugs are young people mm -hmm. who are unemployed and probably do not see any opening for them to be able to... So you think this is as a result of frustration, brain drain? Addiction usually... Poverty? Addiction usually is a means for an, for an escape. Hmm. So you come out, you finish secondary school, you struggle to get, you don't have a job, maybe you struggle to pass jam. You need to get something to... And it can be depressing. We're all human beings. You want to be happy. You want to be able to wake up in the morning and look at tomorrow and say, okay, I, I have an expectation. Uh, someday I'm going to finish school, you know, buy a car, get married and stuff like that. But when there's nothing on the horizon, you need something to, 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 to chase away those demons. Talking about depression, a few months ago, the world, world all over celebrated World Mental, Mental Health Day. And yes. the issue mostly that came up more often was depression. And in this part of the world, we look at it as something demonic. So they, once we say you're depressed, I bind that spirit of depression. You know, we really don't look at it as a, a serious health issue where people... And, and how can we, as a doctor, of course, how can we tell that someone is depressed? What are those things that we need to look out for so we can make those referrals? Again, education is important, but we don't know. You know so how do we even handle it? Because that's where you start pinning or nipping it in the bud before it goes as far as, you know, taking codeine and the rest of it? When I was younger, growing up, the culture and the way we were taught was more of, it was a community that I raised the kid. And the mantra then was, we watch out for each other. Mm -hmm. So I, I dare not go to the next street and misbehave because I know Maybe my mom's friend is on that mm. street and she would say, ah, what are you on doing? Of your mom. Uh, yes, and tell you, you know. <laughs> so a lot of that is not evident now. And people are left 
there really isn't that much of uh, my brother's keeper anymore. Mm -hmm. And when people, there's a lot of competition for things. When, so when people are not getting what they need, there really isn't that support structure. And then economic factors, social factors have come into play. You need to get a good job. You need to get drive a good car. You need to look good. It's the pressure from society. Isn't and it? you're not meeting up, which is also very reasonable. Not everybody gets it at the same time. It boils down, again, to value systems. So sometimes, and then the other thing there is that there really isn't, in quotes, I mean, I don't want to come as if I'm hammering them on the government too much, mm. but, you know, the government is carrying the trust and expectations and hopes of the entire nation on their shoulders. Okay. And we expect that they should be able to project what are the possible problems. Okay. All right. Quickly, because we do, we're running out of time, let's talk about doctors running away from Nigeria. It's very alarming. The rate is, you know, increasing day to day, either they're going to the States or the UK or Canada. What is responsible for this? And how can we keep our doctors? Because we barely have enough doctors as it were. Okay, number one, this is not a new thing. It's been but on... But it's, it's on the increase. It's been on for a while. It's been there. And a number of, a number of things contribute to it. Presently, ASU is on strike. So even the migration starts at the undergraduate level, sometimes. So you get in, you're struggling. Some people just decide to go and study medicine outside the country. Mm -hmm. So that is the first point. The second thing there is that there's very, the, uh, the educational system has been suffering. So even from secondary school, people are bothered about what quality. Even when ASU is not on strike, mm. you're bothered about the quality. Then. You qualify as a doctor, opportunities are becoming fewer and far between. Um, it's getting longer and longer to get a placement for house job. When I qualified, to get house job was, I mean, people were getting That's two or three friendship. offers. Yes, house friendship. Okay. That's getting more difficult. And then you finish that, you want to do residency, you struggle to get in a place. And then it's a lot easier for you to get placement. You want to go outside, so, you get better respect. Get, more, it's also an economic so decision. So the opportunities out there are, are better compared to what we have in the Competition-wise, we don't stand a chance. All right, Dr. Babajide, unfortunately, we have to wrap it here. Um, I wish that we could continue, but it has been a very interesting uh, conversation. Thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you for having me. Well, that's been the show this morning, talking about 2018 in review. Well, we look forward to 2019 and all that it has to offer. And of course, as we proceed into the election year, of course, our fingers are crossed and we hope for the best. I am Mary Anakun. Thank you for watching.